Good morning, welcome. This is the final video of the semester. And this one is on reconstruction. And I'll just get into it. It's going to be nice and short. And um, you have your final exam to do as well. I'll just go ahead and let you know your final exam it is 45 multiple choice questions. And I started with a question about the moral and market economy. And I also have a question in there about Martha Ballard. So make sure that you review those items. But that's where the test starts is with a question about the moral economy and talking about the Lowell Mill girl and Martha Ballard. And then there's one really, really easy short answer question. And um, just make sure that you answer it fully and I think you did okay. As far as studying, uh, if you've been watching these videos, you've been studying all along. And every question from the final exam is from one of these videos. So make sure that you go back and watch it. All right, reconstruction. Let's just get this going. Here. I really want you to know that the planning for reconstruction, it started way back in 1863. Um, President Lincoln knew pretty quickly that the North was going to win, and so he had to come up with plans on how to bring the Southern population back in. And he comes up with what he calls the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. The Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction, we know it better as Lincoln's 10% plan. And I have here listed what it was supposed to be. Uh, basically, 10% of the people who voted in the 1860 election had to pledge allegiance to the United States. Once they did that, then a new state government could be created, but any Confederate military officer and any Confederate um, law lawmaker, official, if you will, was excluded. Congress didn't like that. Congress said that Lincoln was being too nice. Congress basically said, you're just giving them a slap on the wrist. And so they didn't agree with it. And there are different plans made in Congress. You have Benjamin Wade and Henry Davis, the senator and a representative, they come up with their own plan and they say, you know what, 10% isn't enough. We need 50% of all voters to take the Pledge of Allegiance. And we're gonna add this ironclad oath And this ironclad oath said, I never supported the Confederacy in any way. Only after 50% of the people pledged allegiance and after 50% of the people gave the ironclad oath could a state government be reformed. So the way Davisville was much more harsh. Now people ask sometimes why Lincoln was so simple why he was so kind to the South. And really it comes down to a couple of things. Number one, remember Lincoln's a politician. He wants to be reelected. And he wants the people of the South to vote for him once they're allowed back into the Union. The second thing, Lincoln feels like if he see, if the people from the South see that he's not going to punish them, they'll be more likely to abandon the Southern cause. And thirdly, he wanted to get it done and over with and bring everybody back together. Congress, on the other hand, they thought that the Southerners needed to be punished. They thought that the Southern people need to be punished. And that's why you have two very, very different plans for reconstruction. Well, Lincoln never signs the Wade Davis bill. Congress and the Senate never pass Lincoln's 10% bill. And when Lincoln is killed in April of 1865, there's absolutely no plan on what to do. About the only thing that was known for sure is that emancipation was coming. And the only thing that was known for sure is that the government was going to have to deal with all these former slaves. So uh, as, as I mentioned in the last video, the Emancipation Proclamation, even though it didn't actually free the slaves, it completely turned the focus of the war on the slavery. 
So what's going to happen if we have absolutely no plan on what to do? Um, how, how is this going to work? Well, it's decided that somebody is going to have to deal with these freed persons. And at first, it's the Union Army. But the Army, they really only have enough supplies to give the people, like, maybe a tent, a blanket, and a meal. And then they have to continue because they still have work to do. The U.S. Treasury Department agents, they're the ones who have the money, but they don't want to give the money away for free. And they want the former slaves to get back to work as quickly as they can. Then we have private businessmen. They're going to see how can we benefit from this? How can we make money? So private businessmen from the north, they're going to get leases on farms. They're going to put these people back to work, but they're not going to pay them very well. They, these former slaves will be paid, but it's going to be very little pay. And what pay they do get is basically going to go straight to their food, their clothing, their medical help, and everything like that. So really, after the former slave is the former slave, everybody's looking for a way to benefit off of them and make money from them. But what about the former slaves? Well, they have to go through a couple of steps before they can actually find freedom. Um, first and foremost, they have to decide, is it safe for me to leave where I've known? Is it safe for me to leave home? Then you have to figure out, well, how do we find family members? How do we figure out our marriages? Because, you know, sometimes married people are sold apart. Um, what are we going to do to make a living? Are we going to purchase our own farm? Are we going to work for somebody else? Are we going to share crops? They even have to figure out, you know, who in the family is going to work. Is it going to be just be the man? Is it going to be the man and the, and the wife? Is it going to be the children? Is it going to be only the children? These are all things they have to figure out, too. The main group that is going to help these former slaves is the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau is officially known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and abandoned the lands. Now that's a mouthful, and I'm sure you can see why we just shortened it to the Freedmen's Bureau. Now the Freedmen's Bureau, it was begun in March of 1865, and its job is going to be to give these former slaves food, clothing, legal assistance, education, medical care, basically help them get on their feet and get started. You're also going to get Northern Missionary Societies. Um, specifically the American Missionary Association. And they're gonna set up schools based on the work that they have done in Africa. And they're also gonna set up African-American churches. And these African-American churches are gonna be a place where the, these uh, newly freed slaves can create their own places to worship. They can create their own community. And they're gonna be able to create their own leadership and this leadership is going to translate into both politics and community at the same time. Now, what were the conditions of these former slaves? Well, in reality, their new jobs are very much different than their old jobs. If you worked in the field as a slave, you're going to work in the field as a freedman. If you worked in an industry as a slave, you're going to work in an industry as a freedman. About the biggest thing that changes is that blacks are now being paid. They're now free. But everything that they are earning still has to be turned over for food and clothing and everything else. So they're not really pocketing much money. They're breaking even at best. In the South, labor is going to be forced for a time. And it actually becomes illegal to be unemployed. Vagrancy becomes a crime. Let's think about that. It's illegal to be homeless. It's illegal to be jobless. And all of this is going to lead to something called black codes. Now, there is a question on the final exam about this, and I want to make it clear. Black codes are not the same thing as Jim Crow. Jim Crow is much better known, but Jim Crow 
is going to come in in the late 1800s. Black codes are almost immediately after the Civil War. I'm talking like the fall of 1865, the spring of 1866. Once the slaves are freed, Southern state legislatures, they start to pass these laws that are designed to reestablish white control over the black community. And the backbone of these laws are the laws forbidding vagrancy and unemployment. If a person is found to be a vagrant, then they would face a fine. If they couldn't pay the fine, then they would go to jail. And if they go to jail, they probably can't pay the bail either. So what would happen is a former slave owner would come to the jail, pay the bail of one of these imprisoned black people, and then the, the former slave or the, the black person, if they weren't a slave, the African-American, if you will, that person would have to work for the, the white business owner or the white plantation owner or the white farmer that paid off their debts. What does that mean? It's slavery by a different name. Slavery has officially ended, but we go back to that whole indentured servitude that we had almost at the beginning of this class. So it's illegal to be unemployed. You get thrown in jail. Somebody else pays off your debt and you have to work for that person until your debt is paid. If that's not difficult enough, some of these black codes, they restricted your movement. They restricted where you could and could not go. Some codes forbid African-Americans from owning or renting land. And there are even some black codes that required free persons to take jobs only as farm laborers and only as domestic servants. It becomes a crime to break a contract. It becomes a crime to assemble in large numbers. And by the way, large numbers, they mean more than three. And it was illegal to act in an insulting manner towards a white. And there was no specific definition of that either. These black codes are basically a gotcha. If you do anything that the, that the Southern white doesn't agree with, you're gonna be thrown in jail and you're gonna be put back into this indentured servitude which very, very closely mirrors slave slavery. Now, President Andrew Johnson, this is an interesting guy. Uh, he was Lincoln's vice president, but he was a Southerner from Tennessee. He was also a Democrat. Remember, Lincoln is a Republican of sorts. And in 1864, he is going to ask Andrew Johnson, a Democrat, to join his presidential ticket because he thinks, if I get a Southern Democrat on board, with me, the people of the South will see I'm trying to be friendly and they will stop fighting quicker. Now, Andrew Johnson, um, he is going to think that the South is doing just fine. He's okay with black codes. And he actually vetoes the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and he vetoes the Freedmen's he didn't think that any of that was needed. Because of his veto of the Freedmen Bureau Act and because of his veto of the Civil Rights Act, Congress is going to accuse Johnson of high crimes and misdemeanors. And they're going to impeach him and try to get him removed from office. When it comes down to the actual vote, Johnson is going to remain president by one single vote. And the person who was the, the deciding votes uh, basically said, I don't want this to be the way that presidents are removed in the future. Now, once the whole impeachment argument and the impeachment vote is over, Johnson just kind of sits back and relaxes I think he's just happy that he survived and that he's still president. And the 
Republican Party, they're going to pick up a lot of votes in Congress in the election of 1866. And Congress is really going to take over the way this reconstruction is going to be done. And we call this period radical reconstruction. And it starts with the Reconstruction Act of 1867. This Reconstruction Act of 1867, it's going to invalidate, meaning it's going to close or cancel all the state governments that Andrew Johnson approved. With one exception, Tennessee is allowed to stay as a state because that's where Johnson was from. The South is going to be controlled by military generals. Martial law is going to be declared. And there are five military districts that are established. The only way for one of these Southern states to be recreated is to write new state constitutions that guaranteed black suffrage and states had to ratify the 14th Amendment. And what did the 14th Amendment do? It overturned the Dred Scott case and it made the Civil Rights Act into an amendment. Okay, well that's nice, but what did the Civil Rights Act of 1866 do? All people born in the United States are considered citizens and African Americans are allowed to sign contracts, sue, testify, buy, sell, trade, Basically, it gives African-American citizenship. The Democratic Party in the South is going to be suppressed at the time because it was forbidden for former Confederate leaders to be in government power. And because the Democratic Party was repressed or suppressed. Southern state governments were dominated by Republicans. Now, just a real quick note, if you look around today in the South, many elected officials are Republican today, but that's not how it was always. Um, today's Republican wave started in the early 2000s. From basically 1873 until 2000, Almost every single elected official from a Southern state was a member of the Democratic Party. So just know that this Republican domination that happens after the Civil War, it ends in 1873, and Republicans don't come back into power in the South until about 2000, maybe 2001. There are a lot of people who do not like Reconstruction. There are political attacks where conservatives appeal to Southern whites and it's all based on money and, and racial equality. There are violent attacks. The, this paramilitary group called the Red Shirts come to power. Uh, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, it's originally a social club and it turns into this violent group of people. And when I say violent group of people, they're basically equal opportunity violence. If you're a black voter, a white Republican, a leader of a union, if you're a Free Freedmen's Bureau worker, uh, the KKK is going to target all of those people. And they also target uh, Jewish people as well. Another interesting side note, the KKK of the 1860s is not the same KKK we have today. The KKK we have today is actually the third iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. Now Congress, they have to deal with this and they respond to the violence with the Enforcement Acts and the KKK Act. Now what that did is it outlawed Klan violence, it allowed the federal government to arrest Klan members, and it authorized the government, specifically the military, to supervise elections and make sure that elections were done safely. Now there are three amendments that you need to know. There's the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment is ratified December 6, 1865. That officially ends slavery. The 14th Amendment 
ratified July 9th, 1868. As I said a few seconds ago, that's what gave African Americans the right of citizenship. And then the 15th Amendment ratified February 26th, 1869. That gave all males, whether they're white, black, green, blue, red, it didn't matter what color they were, didn't matter their race, it gave all males the right to vote. Now there is a lot more to reconstruction. Um, however, this is all that you need to know for our class. If reconstruction is something that you're interested in knowing more about, I do talk about that more in detail with US history too. All right, so if you have any questions on anything, you know, of course you can email me. Uh, it's been a pleasure being your instructor. Uh, I wish I had gotten to meet some of you in person. Maybe I will here down the line. Uh, for your final exam, again, make sure that you watch all the videos that I've created. It starts with the moral economy, and then we talk about the market economy, Martha Ballard, and then it goes all the way on from there to this Reconstruction Era Amendment. So 45 questions that are multiple choice, one short answer question, and uh, you have all this week to take it. All right, it has been a pleasure once again. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for putting up with it. And I hope that you all have great grades at the end of this semester. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.